So today we are going to talk about uh, transplantation immunology. Um, I wrote a schedule on the board last week or so where I indicated that on Friday we're going to do cancer immunology. I'm actually going to do cancer immunology on Monday next week. Be and I'm going to do vaccines on Friday because I realized that I was going to want to talk about cancer vaccines. And so I can't really talk about cancer vaccines if I haven't talked about vaccines. Um, so I was flipping those two things around. Um, this slide shows you uh, some information about uh, information with transplants and the importance of transplants. So this is showing uh, the number of transplants performed in the United States in 2016 for select organs. Um, so you can see uh, that there were a number of heart transplants. You can see that uh, by far the largest number of uh, the transplants listed here are kidney transplants. You can see uh, pancreas or combined kidney pancreas, intestine, liver, lungs, or combined heart lung. Um, this does not show, um, in fact, the most common transplant, which would be a blood transfusion. Um, so uh, getting blood cells. This doesn't show bone marrow. It also doesn't show things like a cornea transplant. Um, but these are many of the uh, pretty famous and important transplant examples. Uh, as you'll see as we move forward today, um, in general, when we think about transplant immunology, we often divide the transplant the transplanted tissue or the transplant types into two broad classes. Um, we often will either talk about solid organ transplants or we'll talk about um, immune cell or bone marrow transplants because bone marrow transplants have some of their own specific issues. Um, I guess blood transfusion would be its own thing too because it's not a solid organ. Um, what you see on this slide are some of the most critical solid organs. Um, there are even things beyond this that um, can be transplanted, which are a whole other interesting story in, in and to themselves, um, though I probably won't go there today, although if somebody asks a question, I could totally go there because it's cool. Um, one thing I will also point out is that um, when I mean to say a solid organ transplant, I very frequently default to saying a kidney. Um, part of that's because kidneys are transplanted so frequently. And so if I talk about a kidney transplant today, I'm kind of using that to represent any type of solid organ. Um, so don't assume everything is just kidney specific when I'm talking about it. So some of the details or some of the parts of the process um, in thinking about um, transplantation are shown here. So we can imagine first um, that a organ becomes available for transplantation. Um, we'll have some patient who is generally waiting on some sort of waiting list. Um, and when that organ becomes available, the patient will get a call, perhaps in the middle of the night, as is shown here. Um, and it will be really important to get that organ and that patient quickly as possible. So the organ be sort of flown to the transplant center. Um, preservation of the organ is going to be really important. Getting this surgery done as quickly as possible is really important. Um, and this, looking at sort of those steps at the beginning, involves a fair amount of time, effort, um, expense, all of those types of things in order to pull this off. And generally, this is something that is going to be life-saving for that patient. The patient is going to only be able to live a short period of time without the organ that they need. And this is going to really sort of save their lives, cure some particularly bad problem that they have. This makes it all the more of a problem when we have situations where the recipient's immune system attacks that organ like that kidney and, in fact, destroys it and leads to rejection. Um, and so this is a rejected kidney um, that has been destroyed by the immune system. And so you can imagine how problematic it is for all parties involved to sort of go through all of this to try to save a patient's life and then to simply have that kidney get rejected. Uh, and so understanding the immune responses that are part of this and ways that we might be able to intervene um, are pretty important. Uh, 
Um, so immunologists in the past um, studied uh, transplants for a while. Um, they first were doing this with a lot of skin grafts. And they showed that if they had a mouse, say, of strain B, and gave that mouse a non-matching skin graft, a graft from strain A, that mouse would reject the transplant. So you can see the rejection process happening here. Um, the, and if that mouse were to then get a second skin graft from that same strain, a second strain A skin graft, um, rejection would again happen. And it would happen now in a much quicker period of time, like six days, instead of the 14 days that they saw before. Um, and that indicated to them that there was an immune system component to this process. This looked like a primary and then a secondary type of response. You were getting some sort of memory and some sort of improved immune response the second time through. Um, they also realized that if they took T cells from the spleen of this mouse that had undergone rejection of this first skin graft and transplanted those spleen T cells, um, into a naive mouse and then did a transplant on that mouse, the mouse would also have a, a faster type of rejection. And so this was indicating that perhaps this was T cell mediated um, with this process. And again, it suggested that adaptive immunity was playing a key role in transplant rejection. And so that's one of the way, many reasons why immunologists sort of got into this process. You can see um, that two different parts of this process are labeled as either first set rejection or second set rejection on this slide. So that first kind of primary response like rejection is called uh, first set rejection and the um, sort of secondary response like process is the second set rejection. You can also see um, that process here um, where in a perfect world, we would put in our um, transplanted tissue. You can see that little piece of skin at the top. Ideally, blood vessels are going to grow in. We're going to have repair, so we get that tissue sort of to heal back into place. We're going to have all of the vessels and cells come in, and we're sort of going to get this nice healing process. But within first set rejection, um, by about 7 to 10 days, uh, after the um, transplant has happened, you'll see a whole lot of immune cells infiltrating that will start to actually kill that transplanted tissue. And you see that happening much faster in second set rejection. Um, this slide also uses a term, um, a couple terms that I just want to get out there because um, I am certain that I will mess up and say them by accident. And so if I introduce them, then that's not an accident, then it's OK. But if I haven't told you what they mean yet, then it's less great. So oftentimes, when we talk about the thing that's getting transplanted, so in this case, it's the skin. In a kidney transplant, it's the kidney. Whatever the thing is that's being transplanted is often referred to as a graft. So if I mention the graft, that means the thing that's getting um, transplanted. Um, immunologists often um, will divide those grafts into a few different, with a few different types with different prefixes. And these prefixes actually can go on a bunch of different things. So we can come up with a bunch of different words with these prefixes. Happily, they pretty much always mean the same thing. So we can talk about something that might be an autograft. And in fact, it, this slide uses the word autograph. Um, there are also things that are known as allografts. Um, and there are further things that are known as xenografts. Um, an autograft is a graft between genetically identical individuals. That's pretty rare. And so usually, we, when we think about an autograft, we actually think about when you are giving a transplant to yourself. 
Um, so for example, if you had blood taken and saved, and then you got in an accident and got your own blood back, that would be an autograph. You'd be getting products from yourself. There are also situations where you'll have skin from one part of your body moved to another part or things like that. All of those are autografts. If we had two genetically identical individuals, it would still be called an autograft. So if I took one of my C57 black six mice and gave its spleen to its identical other mouse, that would be an autograft. Um, so usually auto in immunology means self, just like autoimmunity. Allo, like allograft, um, and we can, sometimes you'll hear the word autotransplantation, where we're transplanting to ourselves. To ourself. Autotransplantation isn't used as much as the other ones are. Um, we can also have an allograft, where we are thinking about allotransplantation. Um, that means that we are doing a transplant between two members of the same species. So, that, so if one of you were to give a kidney to another of you, that would be an allograft. That would be allotransplantation. Sometimes when people talk about transplantation immunology, they in general talk about sort of allo responses. And sort of the, the term allo comes up a lot. Um, I will mention a little bit at the end about xenografts and xenotransplantation. That is when you see transplantation from a different species. So that's when you're getting a transplant from um, a completely foreign species. So one really good piece of news I have for you is that there are three different types of uh, immune responses um, that we see in transplant rejection. And it turns out they have similarities to responses you've already seen. So we're going to talk today about three different kinds of transplant rejection. We're going to talk about them in the order in which they happen. Um, but you can see that one of them is pretty similar to a type 2 hypersensitivity. One of them is pretty similar to a type 3 hypersensitivity. And one of them is pretty similar to a type 4 hypersensitivity. And so if you have those hypersensitivity reactions down from last time, your life is going to be easier um, in terms of understanding these transplant rejection reactions. And if you don't have them down from last time, you're getting a re-explainer today. So of the three types of these, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about them in the order in which they occur. And so the first thing that could happen if a transplant was going to be rejected is something that's known as hyperacute rejection. So hyperacute rejection um, is rejection that happens very early um, after transplantation. So we're talking about maybe a few days after getting a transplant. The mechanism of hyperacute rejection is um, that you are seeing rejection as a result of pre-existing antibodies. So we don't really need to do a ton of work to start up a B cell response and make a T cell response and all of that business. We've got these antibodies pre-existing, so we don't have to wait too long for this rejection to happen. So our um, patient will have antibodies in their body. When we put in the new kidney, those antibodies will start circulating through the kidney when the blood vessels go, start to be connected. Those antibodies will bind to cell surface antigens that are on the walls of the kidney. Um, and you will start to see complements and other types of inflammatory responses in the wall or in the vessel walls in the kidney. And then you will actually see destruction of the blood vessels in the kidney. So then the kidney will not be able to live because it will not be getting um, nutrients and oxygen and all that good stuff. Um, and so this is all because there were pre-existing antibodies um, to the other person, to the donor um, in our recipient. <clears throat> 
you can see that same process happening here, um, clearly not to scale. Or this person has some very large antibodies. <laughs> so this person um, has pre-existing antibodies. Um, it gets the, a transplanted kidney. Those pre-existing antibodies will bind to the wall of the vessels in that kidney. Um, we'll start to see an inflammatory response. We'll actually block the blood vessels. We'll see, maybe see some complement destruction of those blood vessels. And eventually, the kidney will die because it's not going to be getting um, oxygenation and uh, blood flow. Um, so in terms of sort of the big picture of immunology here, it's kind of easy to understand. But the question that might come up here is, OK, but why do I have pre-existing antibodies to other people? How in the world do I have a pre-existing antibody to someone else to lead to this process? There is generally one particular antigen that causes a problem for hyperacute rejection. And so there's one particular antigen that you would have an antibody against um, in terms of other people. And that antigen is the uh, blood group antigen. So um, you can see that red blood cells from a person who, from a donor who is O, have no terminal carbohydrates on their surface. With A, they have one type. With B, they have another type. With A, B, they have both. As a result, in this person who has type O blood, that person makes antibodies against the A antigen and the B antigen. Those B cells that make those antibodies are not deleted because these are not self-antigens. And so those antibodies are present. In the person who has type A, um, the type A antibodies are gone. The B cells are deleted because it's a self-antigen. But B is present. With type B, we've got anti-A antibodies. Um, with type AB, we've got anti we don't have any of these antibodies. And so you can see sort of this whole process here. Um, and this is a big uh, way that we sort of even determine who can be a donor or recipient for blood transfusions. So if you are um, a recipient of type O, you don't really care what antibodies. <laughs> you, you aren't going to sort of, it's not a big deal to you. You um, can, uh, sorry, a, sorry, ugh, O can donate to anybody else. It doesn't have an antigen on its surface, so it's not, those cells are not going to get killed. A type A person can donate to a type A person or a type AB person. Neither of those people have anti-A antibodies. A type B person can donate to a type B or a type AB because um, neither of those people have anti-B antibodies. The red blood cells won't get killed. A type AB person can only donate to a type AB person because this person has neither kind of antibody. These cells won't get killed. Um, you can see that the AB person is sort of the universal recipient. They can receive from anybody, lucky them. Let's, uh, yes, Mark. I'm coming to that, don't worry. <laughs> um, so the one thing that I want to say before addressing Mark's question is um, this is actually the um, list that shows um, compatibility of blood donors and recipients when you add in RH plus and minus. But the reason why I like to show this slide and the reason my students often find this slide interesting is it does have the frequency of each of these uh, different uh, blood types listed at the bottom. Um, and so if you know your blood type, this will tell you whether your blood type is particularly common or particularly rare. Um, so I'm B positive, um, which is like 8.5% of other people. Um, and so you can see sort of those differences here. Yep? Is this like a um, I don't remember off the top of my head what the po where it is. Um, that's a good question. Um, so Mark asked another question here. Mark said, well, this, this means that, you know, that, that type O person, 
who has anti-A and anti-B antibodies, this means they have like one B cell. You know, they have a little bit of those antibodies. We haven't like primed a response, right? Is sort of what Mark was asking. Um, and that makes sense because you say, well, you, the, it should only, we should have just had, how, how did they prime a response to A antigen and B antigen? But if that were the case, then you could do a transplant at least the first time through, and you wouldn't have a problem. And that's not the case. And so you have, it turns out, that O person doesn't have one B cell and doesn't have a teensy bit of anti-A and anti-B antibodies. They actually have a lot, a, enough that it's going to preclude this uh, sort of transfusion. And so there is sort of this question of, well, what's up with that? How did these cells get primed? The answer is that these antigens um, are carbohydrates that are found very commonly on the surface of many different bacteria, particularly bacteria in the intestine. And so um, the B cells that respond to these antigens are in fact getting primed and we are making large amounts of antibodies against either the A or the B antigen. Um, it's just that here that anti-B, or sorry, the anti-A B cell was deleted because it was a self-antigen. But we are still actually priming up a decent response to this. So, it's, so in fact, it's not one B cell. It's a whole bunch. Um, that was something that I remember confused me the first time I learned about this stuff as well. Yep. Uh, no, these are commensals. We can come back to that. Okay. okay. Yeah. No. So so make sure. So as I get later in this, let's like remind me. Um, that particular example the, of a finger is like way hard, but we can go through all. There are a bunch of things going on there. Um, so I want us to think for a second about hyperacute rejection. Let's imagine that you are a transplant surgeon. How could you prevent hyperacute rejection? You don't want your patients to lose their kidneys due to rejection. So what are you going to do to prevent hyperacute? Yeah. Have we seen MHC in this process? No. no. <laughs> yeah. What? OK, you could block the antibodies. There's something way simpler and way cheaper that takes five minutes. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Check the patient's blood type before you do the transplant. <laughs> Just do a very quick blood typing to make sure that this is not going to be a problem. Um, this is done pretty commonly. Um, I was sort of vague about how long hyperacute rejection takes because hyperacute rejection doesn't actually happen all that frequently anymore. Every so often we see it. Hi. Oh, thanks. Um, every so often, it does happen. What, you get delivered? Yeah. And, um, and generally, it's because, I um, wasn't expecting that. Um, generally, it's because um, they forgot to do uh, blood typing before they did the transplant, and generally, the hospital gets sued a lot. <laughs> A lot, a lot, a lot of, it's a, and it's a big scandal in the news. Um, so this one's actually pretty easy to avoid, and for the most part, we avoid this. Um, if for some reason you happen to have some other rare ant pre-existing antibody, again, I don't know exactly why you'd have it, but if for some reason you did, you could have hyperacute rejection, but this is a pretty rare thing at this point. Um, so... Our next type of rejection, and the one that we're really going to spend the most of our time talking about, is the one that kind of happens in the medium term, um, which is known as acute rejection. Um, acute rejection, you can see here, is listed as being somewhat similar to a type 4 hypersensitivity response. And if you remember, with our type 4 hypersensitivity response, that hypersensitivity response was unique compared to all of the other hypersensitivity responses because that hypersensitivity response involved T cells and all the other ones were antibody based. So 
that should tell you a bit about how acute rejection works. Um, so in acute rejection, um, our patient will um, get a kidney. Um, and eventually, there will be T cells that migrate to that kidney and start to destroy that kidney graft. Particularly, you can imagine CD8 T cells killing some of the cells of the kidney graft. Um, but you can see any number of things. And so here you can actually see T cells infiltrating into the kidney and starting to destroy that kidney as a part of acute rejection. Yep? So the example with the mouse, it was probably acute rejection, yes. Um, so just like with what you saw in um, the type 4 hypersensitivity response, there are a couple of different parts to this process. Um, one of them is something known as the sensitization phase, where we first have to activate the T cells in order to um, get those T cells um, turned on and making a response. So we're going to have to get antigen from the kidney going to um, the lymph node and turning on T cells. After that, those T cells will then leave the lymph node, travel back to the kidney, and start to kill target cells, make cytokines to lead to inflammation, and eventually lead to the rejection of that graft. Based on what you're seeing here, how long do you think it takes for acute rejection to start happening? What, what sort of time frame do you think we're talking about here? Yes, longer. How much longer? 12 years? Hmm? How long? Hmm? Yeah, two, three weeks, a month. You know, you don't really start to see, an, you see an adaptive response peaking at a couple weeks. It might take a little while for that kidney to get totally destroyed, but we're kind of talking in that, you know, two weeks to a month phase. So the patient, you know, goes home, thinks they're good, and then starts to see problems later on. Um, we can also think a little bit about um, what's going on with um, the antigen in this case. And this goes back to some relatively classic immunology. You've actually seen um, something, some experiments similar to the ones I'm going to show you. Um, I will come back to this to answer part of Lexi's question later. <laughs> um, but what you can see is that if we have a mouse who is of strain A and MHC type A, and we do an autograft on that mouse, or a syngenaic graft. Sometimes people do auto or do syn instead of auto. Um, we see no rejection. However, if there is an MHC mismatch, then the graft is rejected. And so our allogeneic graft is rejected. Um, similarly, if we have um, a strain B mouse and we give that strain B skin to a strain A times B recipient, um, so the child, um, we're going to see no rejection. If we go from the child to the parent, there is this nice MHC mismatch, and we see graft rejection. Um, one thing I want to tell you is that sometimes people look at these data and they think, sweet, I can have my mom's organs. <laughs> um, you, you are not an inbred mouse. So with humans, it doesn't work quite as easily in terms of parent versus child <laughs> as it does here with the mice. Um, the take home message that I want you to get from these data is less about whether or not you can have your parents organs and more about the fact that MHC is important in um, whether or not transplants will actually uh, uh, persist through acute rejection. Generally, for acute rejection, the most important antigen that we see is MHC. It's the major 
histocompatibility compatibility complex. And that's actually how it got its name. It was, it was the most important gene in transplant. Um, what you can see is that um, this shows how many MHCs uh, genes are matched or mismatched, how long, what's the percentage of likelihood that the patient is going to keep their graft for 10 years, and what's the half-life of the graft. And you can see that with increasing numbers of MHC mismatches, we will have increasing um, rejection. Um, so you want to have good MHC matching in order to keep a graft for a long period of time. Yep? Because we used to have more stuff to talk about still. <laughs> um, so this leads to one of my quite possibly least favorite sets of slides of the year. Everyone always gets very confused. I promise it's not as confusing as you want to make it to be. But I showed you this previously. Um, and I showed you this slide to talk about MHC restriction. I told you that in order for a T cell to make a response, that T cell needs to um, have a good match with MHC plus peptide and be able to see both. If either the MHC or the peptide does not match, the T cell doesn't recognize, there is no response. Um, and I told you this. Um, I told you about Zinkerdegel and Doherty's experiments where they were using um, mice infected with a virus of different strains and looking to see whether the cells killed or did not kill. And all the data and everything I told you about that experiment is correct. Um, but I also just told you that in transplantation, if the MHC is mismatched, T cells kill the graft in acute rejection. So I just said if the MHC doesn't match, the T cells kill. But here it says T cells don't kill. <laughs> and so what I have to tell you now is I kind of oversimplified some MHC things before. <laughs> um, here you can see the view from the T cells perspective. So here you can imagine you are the T cell looking at the antigen presenting cell. You can see the MHC class one heavy chain in white, beta 2M's way in the back in blue. And you can see the peptide in orange. Here you can see class one. We've got the alpha and beta chains in different colors in the white and the blue. We can see our peptide in orange. Now, if you were a T cell, the, and this is sort of as a, a structural model that shows you where all the amino acids are. So the space-filled structure model. This is what it actually looks like, what the surface would be looking like that you'd be looking down on. If you were a T cell, all of those different parts would not be color-coded. You would not look at an amino acid and be like, oh, this is a peptide amino acid, or oh, this is an MHC amino acid. To you, it would be one contiguous biochemical surface. Um, and so there are, and so we can see situations like sort of the classic one that I told you about before, where we have self MHC that has a particular shape. It has a pocket that can bind to a peptide. Um, and um, we can see some residues from the peptide also interacting with that T cell receptor. You can imagine. In a sort of perfect world, the, the MHC could be way structurally different than self MHC. So here you can see they're like totally different shapes. They're like way structurally different. In that case, the T cell is not going to bind. The T cell is not going to get confused and bind in the wrong spot. It turns out Zinkernagel and Doherty, when they did this experiment and won the Nobel Prize, super lucked out. They happened to pick two mice, uh, two strains of mice that had MHC types that we now know are very structurally different. And so they got no background reaction. And they saw absolutely no recognition when the MHC type did not match. Um, but in reality, sometimes different MHC types might have amino acids that can interact with the T cell. <laughs> 
and sort of fake the T cell out. It looks like a peptide. So you can see this MHC has two square amino acids. Here, the T cell is responding to square amino acids of the peptide. Here, the MHC has those square amino acids. And so the T cell gets tricked. It thinks it's responding to peptide, but in fact, it's really responding to MHC. And it's because purple MHC and green MHC are kind of somewhat structurally similar. You could also see situations where um, one MHC is kind of similar to the MHC plus peptide that the T cell wants to see. And when you add in a peptide, you get the full similarity. So here you can see the, um, the foreign MHC, the allo MHC, has a square amino acid. And when we add in a peptide that has the other square, suddenly the T cell can get activated. And so in reality, because the T cell is seeing that surface of the MHC plus peptide, there are situations where some types of MHC structure will um, be able to activate the T cell and fool the T cell and be able to uh, lead to T cell uh, activation. Um, and so this is sort of one of the ways that we get those T cells turned on in an MHC mismatched situation um, to lead to acute rejection. <coughs> Officially, the thing that I have just told you about is known as direct allo recognition. So perhaps we have a cell, here it's APC, it could be a dendritic cell, it could be a whatever cell you want it to be. Um, we have a cell from the donor. This is a cell that's from the kidney. And it could happen that the donor MHC, the kidney MHC, is recognized by the host's T cells directly. The T cells get turned on. They say, whoa, there's this foreign whole kidney thing. And they go back to the kidney. They're recognizing that MHC on the cells, and they will kill the kidney graft. You can see direct um, allo recognition on this next slide as well, where we have a, here it's listed as a DC from the kidney, but you could imagine it as a kidney cell. You can imagine it as whatever you want. It's just presenting its MHC as it does, and it happens that T cells from the host have just the right recognition ability to bind to that MHC and lead to destruction of the kidney. There is also something called indirect allo recognition um, that can be responsible for T cell responses in an MHC mismatched transplant type. Um, this, one, this slide doesn't show it quite as nicely as the, the other version. Again, notice that we have a um, MHC or a, a cell from the transplant. So this is from the graft. This is from our kidney, this APC. Again, it's presenting something to the T cell receptor. The difference is in what is being presented. And I do like this slide better for um, indicating what is being presented. Um, so you can imagine that when we do a transplant, when I give you a new kidney, um, that kidney is coming from some donor. It had to be taken out of the person's body, perhaps moved some location, you know, stored, put back in you. That's not going to be great for that kidney. Some cells of that kidney are going to die. And so you can see some cells perhaps dying. Those cells may be phagocytosed by other cells. Um, they might be cells from the host, from the person who got the kidney. So we've got dead kidney cells. Notice the kidney cells are, are yellow here. And they're dead, and they have yellow MHCs. <laughs> when those cells get phagocytosed, um, they're uh, MHC molecules are proteins. And as such, they get degraded, as do every other protein from that dead cell. And those MHCs get degraded and become peptides. You can see here they're yellow peptides. They were yellow proteins because they came from the yellow cell. 
This cell's orange, so it's not the same ty MHC type. We get these peptides made from this foreign MHC. They could be presented on the recipient's MHC and presented to a T cell. And they can be like, look at this foreign protein I found. Um, and thus, we can have T cells be activated that way. So instead of the recipient's T cells directly seeing the MHC that's like sort of unprocessed on the surface of the donor or the, the graft cells, we can actually see um, presentation of that foreign MHC on the host MHC um, and activation of T cells that way. That process is known as indirect allo recognition. So um, you can see uh, a couple of ways that um, there are some issues with this process. So there are still questions that we can ask at this point. Um, and one of the questions is why transplants are rejected even with zero MHC mismatches. Um, there are a couple of reasons here. I'm going to go through the reason that I kind of have the slides for, um, and then I'll come back to address the other situation um, that Lexi brought up. So let's imagine that Mark and Vade have identical MHC. Okay? So we're going to imagine that for a second. They have identical MHC. And let's imagine that uh, Vade is going to give Mark a kidney, OK? Because Vade's a nice guy. <laughs> um, there is a reason why Vade's kidney could be rejected in Mark. So again, we're going to imagine they have identical MHCs. Can you envision a reason why Vade's kidney might be rejected in Mark? Uh, if, if, we, if I want to like simplify this process a little bit, we can also imagine in, uh, that Robert gave a kidney to Brianna. This is actually even a more obvious example on this. Yeah? It is because of the minor histocompatibility antigens. What are those? Oh, yeah. OK. I was just thinking if there's any other foreign antigen that might be presented from the donor cells, like that's just not recognized, like when you said, Robert, Yeah. So while I told you that Mark and Vade have the same MHC types, that doesn't mean that every other gene in their genome is the same. And so there is probably some other protein that varies between them. The MHC is the major gene that varies between them for transplant rejection. But there are other genes that are different because they're not completely identical. And similarly, the really obvious example is when you go from male to female, there's all those Y chromosome antigens. And those are just every other genetic difference between two individuals um, could be a minor histocompatibility antigen. So minor histocompatibility antigen is kind of just a fancy way of saying every other polymorphism between two people who are not genetically identical. Um, and so um, you can see that in our donor, you might have this flower protein with a red part on it. And in the recipient, you might have the flower protein with the blue part on it. And so if we put in, um, if some of the cells from the donor are put into this recipient, this red antigen is foreign and is going to be recognized as a foreign protein. Maybe it's just, maybe there's a, a point mutation that changed the amino acid, but it makes this a foreign protein in the recipient. Um, usually there is uh, less of, there's sort of less of these proteins available and on the surface of cells. And so minor histocompatibility mismatches are slower. Um, the rejection is a bit slower than with MHC mismatches, but you absolutely can still see this type of mismatch. Um, and so um, sort of the minor histocompatibility antigen is the big deal here. Um, you can see this as well. Um, 
If I have a mouse that is MHC type A, I give its skin to an MHC type A genetically identical recipient, the graft stays, it's tolerated. Um, if we go between MHC mismatched, we see a pretty rapid rejection, and because that's, there's a lot of MHC, that, there's a lot of antigen to stimulate those T cells really well, we get a, a big response. If, say, we have um, two mice that have the same MHC, but have some other genetic difference, say in making them orange versus yellow, um, you'll see the rejection via uh, the uh, major histocompatibility or the minor histocompatibility antigens, though it will be a bit slower. Um, just to address um, Lexi's other question for a second. Um, so you could say, well, what about, you know, because this implies that the MHCA to MHCA process is perfect. It's 100% survival. Um, and sort of not totally true. It might be 90% survival or something a little bit less than that. When you do this process, you can imagine when you cut off a piece of skin and put it on to another recipient, you are inducing a fair bit of inflammation. Um, there might be some damage associated molecular patterns. Um, and so there is going to be some background inflammation. This whole process is not inflammation free. Um, that inflammation can lead to some damage of the graft and can potentially lead, could lead to um, lack of survival of the graft if you had a lot of inflammation. That's the biggest reason why you would see that um, type of, of rejection um, is sort of just the fact that you will never get this completely sterile and completely inflammation free. Because um, how did you get the tissue without anything being dead or, you know, like you're, you're just never going to have no dead cells in that process. Um, the other thing that makes some of these situations really complicated is, as you will see in um, a couple of slides, everything I've told you thus far has been about solid organ transplantations. When we go into bone marrow transplantation, things change a little bit. If you were to do, um, I actually once had an immunology student who was really interested in prosthetics and she wrote a whole paper about hand transplants. Um, and a hand transplant, as I learned a lot that semester, or any kind of transplant like that, is particularly problematic because it's actually a skin transplant and a muscle transplant and a bone transplant and, and a blood vessel. And, and so it actually mixes a whole bunch of transplant types all at the same time, which makes this whole process even more complicated. Um, so, in general, in terms of the auto transplant, there's the inflammation issue in a finger being cut off. There's the fact that you're dealing with multiple tissue types as well. Um, so here we've seen all the details of acute rejection. Yes. Yeah, so there are situations, um, and these are being recognized somewhat more, where sometimes a transplant, you know, people will realize that the kidney they transplanted had a pathogen in it, or there just general microbes associated with any of these types of tissues um, can potentially lead to problems. And so that's sort of one of the places where people are trying to figure stuff out now. Um, the final type of transplant rejection that I want to mention um, when talking about solid organ transplants is a chronic rejection. You can see that chronic rejection is listed here as being similar to a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, um, which, if you recall, was the immune complex disease type of hypersensitivity reaction. What you might realize from the name chronic, rea chronic rejection, as well as the time at which I am telling you about it in this lecture, it is the one that is the slowest. Um, where you are generally seeing chronic rejection months to years after um, the transplant. And so again, this is usually the one where the patient totally thinks they're fine and then um, realizes less so. There is a lot less that is understood about chronic rejection and the specific mechanisms by which chronic rejection happens. Um, what we seem to see is that there is sort of this importance of antibodies um, binding to antigen and leading to immune complexes that can bind to the vessel wall. In this case, the antibodies are not pre-existing antibodies. They're antibodies that had to be developed 
in response to donor antigen um, after the transplant has happened. And so this process of priming some T cells and priming some B cells and getting B cell help and getting this to happen enough that we get a lot of antibodies all takes a bit of time. In the end, we have immune complexes that are going to be deposited on the vessel walls. We're going to get inflammatory cells that are going to recognize those immune complexes and that will start to destroy the vessel wall. Um, and you can see this uh, happening here. We somehow have to get a recipient T cell to respond to the foreign MHC as well as help a B cell respond to the do some other donor antigen. We're going to get some antibodies um, and make this whole process go forward. Um, this process does, as I said, take the most time, and it is by far the uh, least uh, well understood. So all of that has to do with solid organ transplants. Um, as I mentioned, things get a little bit different when we go into bone marrow transplants. If you recall, bone marrow is the place where we have stem cells that lead to um, the development of all other types of immune cells. One thing that I haven't told you a ton about thus far is that bone marrow is not 100% stem cells. Um, you kind of saw this back in the flow cytometry lab where we did flow cytometry on bone marrow. There were some B cells and T cells in your bone marrow. And in fact, usually those B cells and T cells are, um, in B cells, it's, some of them are developing B cells. But it, there are also long-lived memory B cells that go back and live there. It's a good source of cytokine that's pretty well protected. It, it's a nice source to support those long-lived B cells. There are also lots of memory T cells in the bone marrow. And so when we do a bone marrow transplant, we can see a situation where the bone marrow that we transplant, which includes those already activated memory B cells and memory T cells, those memory B cells and memory T cells that are part of the bone marrow can actually come out and attack the rest of the body um, of the transplanted patient. Um, and so this is a particular problem. Um, just to sort of get at a little bit of this um, more clearly, um, these are some of the many um, conditions that are treated by bone marrow transplants or BMT, bone marrow transplantation. Um, it includes a huge number of tumor types um, where uh, patients are getting radiation or chemo, as I'll show you on the next slide, and then get bone marrow to sort of regrow their immune system. Sometimes what we do is we actually will take some of the patient's bone marrow before the treatment, give radiation or chemo, and then give them their own bone marrow back. So it's an autologous transplant, an autograft. Or sometimes we'll give um, other types of uh, bone marrow, so it's, allo it's an allogeneic transplant. The other big place to think about bone marrow transplantation is in all of the different types of immunodeficiencies we've talked about. We have a patient, say, who is missing Reg 1 or Reg 2. They can't make their own B cells or T cells. We give them a transplant of bone marrow that has Reg 1 or Reg 2, so they can now make some B cells or T cells from that bone marrow. And so most of the major um, auto or immunodeficiency genetic diseases are also treatable by bone marrow transplantation. And so these are some of the many situations where this additional transplant issue becomes a problem. Yep, I saw you had a question earlier. Um, yeah, so the, the rejection comes mm -hmm. in terms of the bone marrow transplantation. So that would be the, the donors. T yeah, I, I, it's, it's, yeah, they're going to, I'm going to show it to you in a couple oh. slides. Um, so um, again, here you can see this process where um, oftentimes we give our patient radiation and chemotherapy. You see they get empty because they have no more immune system. And then we give them cells from the bone marrow that we've taken from someone else's bone marrow um, as a transplant and reconstitute the immune system. Um, so as Emily just asked, um, what we tend to see in this particular case is something that's called graft versus host disease. So in all the other cases, the host 
immune system was killing the graft. The host was killing the kidney. Here, the bone marrow is killing the host. So the graft is killing the host instead of the host killing the graft. So graft versus host disease. So we can see that the bone marrow that we are putting into our patient contains a mixture of cells, including the memory T cells, which are the blue ones. When those T cells go into the patient, some of them may respond to some antigen in that patient. They could be major histocompatibility. They could be minor histocompatibility. They could be all sorts of fun things. And they are like, whoa, look at how much foreign antigen there is. It's everywhere. They will then leave and go to all sorts of different um, tissues and start destroying those tissues because they're all full of this foreign antigen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, graft versus host disease can be um, classified into a few different uh, grades, grades one through four, um, based on how much of a rash we see in the patient. Um, so, what percentage of the patient's body has rash? Um, what, uh, how much liver destruction there has been, which leads to the production of this uh, thing called serum bilirubin, and how uh, their GI tract. Um, is faring. And so um, graft versus host disease can vary quite a bit um, in terms of um, its severity. And you can see the a graft versus host disease rash um, in the photo at the bottom. Yes? I don't know what grade that is. Yeah, I, I would say two or three. Um, so Let's imagine again that you are a transplant surgeon. Can you imagine any way that you might um, avoid graft versus host disease in your patient? Yeah, Vanessa? Okay, so we can think about bone marrow from children that haven't had activated cells yet. Why do you want to do that? They, then they don't have any memory cells. Um, and so what would you be transplanting in that case? Just the unactivated things. Basically, you would be wanting to transfer just stem cells, right? So Mark, what were you going to say? OK, you can think about matching. Um, so it turns out that what we actually do is now we actually will take that bone marrow from the patient and we will do a purification step to remove everything that's not a stem cell. And so instead of doing full bone marrow transplants, we now usually do what are known as HSC transplants or hematopoietic stem cells. So you just remove everything <laughs> that's not a um, stem cell. You could think about doing that with your flow sorter or something like that. And then you give the patient just this purified stem cells. Um, and the patient ends up doing a lot better. Um, in the past, um, if you were going to be a bone marrow donor, you needed to um, obviously donate stuff from the inside of your bones. Um, and usually it was a big needle into the hip bone um, to get marrow out. Um, it was sort of not super pleasant. We've actually now realized how you can find um, stem cells circulating in the blood. And so in most cases now, it's actually a blood thing. Yeah. Not usually, no. Um, so we can also think a little bit about MHC matching um, when we do bone marrow transplants. Um, and MHC matching is a sort of a particular issue um, because realize that we are putting in stem cells um, that still are going to have to go through the thymus of the patient in order to develop. And so let's imagine first we have a transplant patient where the um, MHC types are matching um, with their own. That means those T cells are going to match with the thymus. We're going to get nice normal T cell development. Eventually our patient will have T cells and our patient will live happily ever after. And so if this patient ever gets infected again, 
it's going to have good T cells. Those T cells can kill infections. Everything's going to be great. If, however, you were to give the patient um, completely mismatched bone marrow, when all of those bone marrow cells go to the thymus, none of them are going to find self-MHC that they can um, react with. They are all, so you're going to get um, them to, uh, some to leave um, the um, thymus. So you'll be like, all right, this is cool. Yay. But they are going to respond to the MHC type of the thymus. All of the dendritic cells and innate immune cells from this patient are going to have the donor's MHC type because those bone marrow cells also make all of your dendritic cells and all of your macrophages. And so the T cells are never going to respond to the dendritic cells in that patient. There's going to be a complete mismatch because the T cells are going to respond to the MHC of the thymus. The dendritic cells are going to have a different MHC type. And so you're not going to see a match. And that patient, if that patient later gets some infections, that patient's going to be out of luck um, because its T cells are not going to be able to respond with its dendritic cells and make those types of responses. Um, and so these data kind of show uh, data on the importance of MHC matching in bone marrow transplantation. Um, I want to sort of pop through the other ones uh, sort of a little bit quickly just because they're important. Um, so usually patients who are getting a bone marrow transplant are often treated with some type of cytotoxic drug um, to kill rapidly dividing cells. Um, but the key medication that is used in transplant ca transplantation cases is cyclosporin A. Um, and we talked about cyclosporin last time. So you already know how cyclosporin works because we just talked about it. Um, but uh, what you should s notice is that um, here you can see some data on the success of cyclosporin. Um, and so you can see that in the black, you can see patients sort of without cyclosporin. Um, that 60% of patients had a, their transplant last for a month, and you can see that then only 40% at three months, and decreasing uh, percentages at different months. And so this patient is getting a life-changing life organ, it's a life-saving organ, and there's maybe only a 25% chance that it's going to work for three years um, before they're going to either need a new organ or they're going to um, not be able to continue living. Um, you can see that when cyclosporin was introduced, it dramatically increased um, survival at one month up to 80%, and it, kept, it keeps patients with their grafts for considerably longer. Um, these data are sort of showing as well um, transplants over time and what was the percent of patients who kept their graft for five years. You can see sort of before cyclosporin was introduced and after cyclosporin was introduced, what percent of patients were keeping their graft. And so cyclosporin really made tra current transplantation possible. Yep, Vanessa. So do they have to take the cyclosporin for years? No, they're basically taking it for life. Um, you can imagine that uh, this is going to immunosuppress them. Um, the other treatments that I are just in here are actually very similar to what you've seen before in terms of things like blocking CTLA-4 or blocking cytokines. It's all the same kind of stuff. But the one thing I wanted to get, make sure I had a chance to just tell you about before we ended today was one final issue in transplantation immunology. So um, this number at the bottom that's shown in orange shows the number of transplants that are performed each year. In the blue, you can see the number of patients who want a transplant each year. And you can see that there is a big mismatch. There are many more patients who want transplants than there are organs available. And so this shows it to you in numbers in terms of how many patients were waiting for different organs um, over time. And so we have this massive shortage of organs. Um, there are two different things that we can kind of think about um, with that. Um, so in the United States, um, we have what's known as an opt-in policy for organ donation. So you have to say, I would like to be an organ donor um, for your organs to be donated. If you don't say that, your organs will not be donated. Um, in other countries, there is an opt-out policy where your organs are automatically donated unless you say you want to be an organ donor. 
um, what you can see is that in countries where there's opt-in, it's a pretty low percentage of people end up actually like doing the paperwork and being donors. Where it's an opt-out, the vast majority are donors. And so there is much less of a problem in those countries. And part of this is just like a laziness thing and a knowing how to sign up kind of thing. Um, but as a result, immunologists have been also working on ways that they might be able to find other sources for organs. Um, and people have started to think about xenotransplantation or transplantation of organs from other animals. <coughs> the animal that is most commonly used is known as a miniature swine, um, which you can see here. Um, they're not very miniature, they're actually huge, but it turns out on a volume basis, their organs are the same, time, same size as ours. You can imagine you would not want a mouse kidney <laughs> having seen a mouse kidney. Um, and people are actually genetically engineering um, these pigs in order to have them have human MHC and a number of other types of factors so that they can be used as human organ transplants. Um, there are also other types of sort of mechanical devices, um, lab grown organs, all sorts of things like that that people are trying to do to deal with these organ shortages. But they need to know an awful lot about the, the immunology of transplant rejection in order to make this process happen. Um, and I will see you guys in lab tomorrow. <laughs>